Hey everybody, it's Richard Harris here with Sales Hacker for our next webinar. We are very, very excited uh, to be talking about how to execute key predictions on the future of sales technology. Um, we are very, very fortunate and excited to have uh, Adam Becker here from Octave, who's going to join us with this. Give us about 30 seconds. We're going to let people sort of move out of one uh, meeting and catch into this one. And I'm just making sure my puppy's not chewing anything. So when you see me digging around in the background, that's just what I'm checking on. So give us about 30 seconds. All right, let's go ahead and get started. She was, of course, chewing on some lint from the dryer. So I apologize for that. So just a couple of housekeeping things first. One, um, yes, we're going to be recording this webinar, and we're more than happy to share that link out with everybody who attended. We'll be posting it on Sales Hacker. So if you have to step out, we totally appreciate it, understand that. Or if there are other folks in your organization who you think would benefit greatly from watching it, we appreciate the share socially. Um, Obviously, please, we love to get questions live and in the moment. There's a question section on the GoToWebinar session as well as a chat feature. Please feel free to go into either or both of them and also introduce yourselves. We love to get to know who's actually attending and tell us a little bit about the name of your organization or how many reps you're looking for or maybe the size of your sales stack or just anything you want to share with us about uh, your business as it's relating to this webinar. Please keep those questions coming. We'd love to get them live and in the moment. And without any further ado, I want to uh, welcome Adam Becker. And for some reason, Adam, I keep wanting to say Adam Grant. I don't know why. Um, um, <laughs> uh, Adam's currently the Senior Director of Commercial Sales and Account Management. He's responsible for growing the new business and the ongoing success of Octave customers. He joined the company in 2012 as the Director of Sales, and he's also served as the Director of New Markets, uh, which led to the entire product launch process from inception to go-to market strategy. The cool thing I love about uh, I love about Adam is just his background in general. Uh, before coming over to Octave, he was with Exact Target back in 2006. Long yeah, time. Back then, right? Yeah. Um, and he he was with the company when it was about 80 employees, and saw it go to 1,300 employees. And of course, through all the massive growth that Exact Target ended up going through, and their their huge exit strategy, and all those things. Um, he started in marketing, optimizing the lead flow. Then he actually went over to sales. So, hey, he may he cross the chasm. Um, I, I hope you still kept your friends on the marketing team. Right. Um, trying my best, yeah. <laughs> a lot of time uh, uh, on the marketing development team and the team lead team. And he finished his tenure at Exact Target as the strategic channel development manager, um, overseeing the success of their top partners in, in uh, the central region. So he also graduated from Taylor University with degrees in design, physics, and business management. So needless to say, even though he's been successfully at Exact Target, Adam is what I always call the classic underachiever. So Adam, I really would like you to start to apply yourself a little bit more. You might be more successful in life. I, um, yeah. well, well, I have some more things I can dabble in, I'm sure. I'm sure. But th anyway, thank you. Thank you for putting up with that long introduction. And, and thanks for joining us. We're very, very excited to talk to you today. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Happy to be here. Great. Um, so, you know, let's, let's, I'd love to talk before you even get into this presentation of, of stuff, you have this amazing background of crossing that chasm literally between marketing and sales. And I think that is, I wish there were more people like that. I wish there were more people who went from sales to marketing and marketing to yeah. sales. Just before we even start, and, and we didn't even prep this question, so I'm, 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 I'm going to, you know, slam you on this one. Sure. What was the biggest adjustment you had to make from going from marketing to sales? Like in your own mentality as a leader, as, as a thought leader, like how did you help make that shift just for yourself? Yeah, uh, that's a, that is a fantastic question. I could probably put my passion pants on for this one for several hours at a time. Um, and it's, it's really interesting spending seven years kind of immersed in, in the MarTech space and really see the evolution of marketing, you learn to love marketers, you learn to talk their talk, you learn to speak their speak, and you learn to, to love what they love, and then making an abrupt shift essentially going over to the sales side, um, not only selling um, sales software, but selling into salespeople. So um, yeah, kind of being a marketer and, and helping to sell and to, to talk to marketers to being a salesperson and selling into salespeople is, is an abrupt shift. Um, and I think the, the thing, I, I can't say it was easy, um, right? You have to learn as you go type of, of thing. But I want to say the, the thing that's really 
um, been the most dramatic change is the uh, as the tolerance for time. Um, and this is, is kind of a big overarching question, but marketers just tend to think in a much broader strokes, right? So um, I'm a marketer. I can um, any changes I make uh, to my uh, uh, say my campaign now or to my messaging now. I will measure those results in six to nine months to see if we're getting an increase of pipeline, if we're getting any types of... I may not be here in six to nine months if I'm in sales. Right. I don't have that time, right? That's right. And so from a, from a sales capacity, like I've been ingrained now in sales for so long, like everything is one quarter long. Everything in my life is one quarter long, no matter whether it's my family and, all, and my kids like everything is one quarter long in my life. And so um, that I think has been the biggest adjustment of where um, just the pace and, and the uh, way that we have to return people's investment is on a much shorter time scale. Things have to be a lot more re realistic. Um, you can't just start talking very aspirationally and hope that that gets the job done. It's very much about what can we do today to make an adjustment to uh, see results tomorrow. And, how, and, and again, because this actually I think is gonna segue great into the survey results. What can marketers take away from that statement, right? That, hey, they think they see this broad stroke, we think in this sort of smaller quarterly thing. And let's yeah. go both ways. What can marketers take away from what you just said? And what could salespeople learn from you as it relates to marketing and communicating back to them? Because that's always seems to be the big gap. Yeah, no, and, and that's, the, that's the reality. I think that, that marketers have had, uh, because of their, their propensity to think a little bit bigger, and quite honestly, especially as we're gonna be talking about technology here, uh, they've had the budget as well. Um, when we think about spend, just pure spend on technology, marketers have, have, hold, have held a lot of that budget other than IT. And so um, when we're thinking about that, they've just had the ability to make these investments to do a lot of this testing. And because of that, we can learn a ton from marketers on the way that they approach problems, the way that the, uh, essentially with how they've learned, and I'm sure we're gonna end up talking about this at some point, but marketers have really led the way in this new revolution of capturing data and leveraging data to make people's lives better, like in general. Um, so sales can learn a lot from that, but I think it goes both ways where salespeople, this is where the, where the rubber meets the road, right? Where, where the kind of reality hits in. And so uh, marketers can, uh, always need to take kind of the leads and, and understanding what should be said right now, um, what should the message be, what's working and what's not working. Um, that's where marketers really need to have their ear close to the ground when it comes to what the customers are saying, what the uh, salespeople are hearing, all of those types of things. So it definitely goes both directions. Um, but, but quite honestly, you talk about this chasm, um, th there, that is a real thing, right? That, that chasm and we do need to work closer and closer and closer together the, and the companies that do that, the, the companies uh, that, that, that really can mesh that in between are the companies that are succeeding. We saw this um, at that Unicor run at, at, at Exact Target. Um, Scott Dorsey, who's the CEO, um, founder, CEO, took it all the way from a one-person company all the way through a couple billion dollar acquisition. It's a sales force. Um, really, really uncommon to see that, that guy happen. He was a sales guy. And he found the yeah. best marketers in the world, and they just worked really, really well um, in the middle of that. So um, definitely, I think we're going to be talking a lot about technology and how technology helps bridge that chasm, bridge that gap in the middle. Great. Well, thank you. thanks for taking a little bit of a detour before we get started. Let's let's jump in onto this future of sales tech because I know that's why people are here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of turn it over to you because I know you're running the presentation and have the data. Yeah, well, uh, definitely jump in here whenever you'd like. But um, just to walk through the agenda for today here, um, uh, making sure everything's catching up. Uh, just a couple quick things we wanted to run through. We had a, we had a, a chance here at Octave to, to walk through a survey with a whole bunch of people. We'll be talking about the results we've seen uh, in that survey, and we're gonna walk through and, and just kind of uh, understand what the questions were, how those respondents came in, and we're gonna just uh, have a conversation around uh, the trends that we're, we're watching in 2018. Um, and again, kind of where the rubber meets the road. What trends do we see from the macro perspective and where does that end uh, up for each of us on the uh, sales side or sales op side? Um, where should we be really thinking about making investments earlier on to get that return? Um, and then how do, we, how do we really leverage those investments to make sure that we are getting more juice for the squeeze, get more, more out of the sales team? So uh, super excited to, to kind of walk through some of these results and, and uh, I suppose without further ado, we're gonna, we're gonna really jump right in. And so um, before, we, before we get to the actual results and the questions here, um, 
what we what we really found were a couple of big highlights, um, and and this really is is the core of, of I think what we were just talking about uh, is that the pace of business that we're finding is uh, is really starting to pick up, and and a lot of this is due to those marketers, right? Marketing has really evolved over the last dozen years, um, where oh, again back in two thousand six when I first started Exact Target. Um, the marketing message was primarily done via mass media, right? We had uh, uh, cards that we got in the mail, we had billboards, we had TV. There was only a limited number of channels, essentially, marketers had the ability to go to market with. Um, and today, when we look at this, we have uh, tons of digital channels, email, mobile, social uh, channels. Uh, websites, obviously, have kind of become a big thing as well. Um, and with that, the number of channels that marketers have at their disposal and the amount of data that they can be captured um, has really revolutionized the way that we as consumers, buyers of products, um, think about uh, the market itself. No longer do we as buyers uh, uh, take it for granted that we have to go and figure out everything for ourselves. We do have some form, whether it's an, uh, it is something that we realize or not, but we uh, basically understand that people are going to be marketing to us and we expect that to be highly relevant. We expect them to know who we are and we expect to them to uh, show us products that we are specifically interested in. Uh, and I think everyone sees that and sometimes it can get kind of annoying, but every time you go and browse for a uh, new pair of shoes on Amazon or something like that, it just seems like the next week, every time you're on some kind of website somewhere, you see that same pair of shoes or you see something adjacent to that and all those on those ads so that's marketers doing their job of collecting information and sometimes they use it for good sometimes it's pretty annoying but uh, but again you you get that tendency to start really um, as a buyer starting to just kind of get used to expecting that people are going to get you what you need based upon who they think you are and what that's doing to uh, the world of sales is really putting the pressure um, as we relay this now over to the b2b sales process um, we're, we're seeing that pressure being put on the sales teams to uh, essentially treat our customers, treat our prospects, treat our buyers in the same fashion uh, as we see consumers in general uh, behavior changing. So we need to understand that buyers are more informed um, than ever before. Uh, the ability for them to go out to our websites, be able to learn more about us um, and do their own research before they even even kind of want to pick up the phone and talk to a salesperson um, is happening. Um, and again, that means that, <clears throat> that people are coming in with more information about you and they expect that you come into the, to the conversation with more information about them, who they are, who their market is, who their industries are. Um, and so that's putting a lot of burden, a lot of uh, pressure on the salespeople to pick up the pace, to be at the top of their game and quite honestly, to employ new tactics and new uh, technologies in order to uh, be able to keep up with that, to be able to succeed and be able to rise to the top. Um, and so we're going to see technology, and obviously that's where we're going to be spending a lot of the conversation today, um, really put that emphasis on how do we leverage that technology the right way um, so it is uh, maybe removing some of that burden. And for the last piece here, how do we also leverage that technology to start learning more? How do we just get better at our job? Uh, in general, I'm a firm believer that there is zero industry out there, the sales industry included, that uh, is immune from the uh, revolution, the digital revolution that's happening. Everything is becoming digitized, um, and it's going to be the winners in this space that are the ones who are going to be able to figure out what to adopt and how to adopt that faster. Um, and it's the people who are going to be kind of getting passed by or the ones that are going to be the laggards, the ones that aren't ready to change, the ones that are resistant to adopting new technologies. And we see this, again, across everything. Um, at one point, the U.S. used to be kind of the, the powerhouse of manufacturing and the powerhouse of, of cars. And um, we see GM and, and Chevy and all those types of things um, started to peter out. But all of a sudden, we have a new kind of a new light in the car industry. Um, we think about what uh, uh, what Tesla is doing out there is just crazy. And he's not reinventing the car itself. It still has four wheels last time I checked and, and some places to sit. But he's, he's revolutionizing the way that people are thinking about cars because of technology, implementing technology in day-to-day -day life. And I believe that that is something that is near and dear to, uh, to, to myself and something that we all need to start to come to grips with. Uh, otherwise, again, our competitors are going to pass us by.
Yeah, there's a couple things so, I want to put in there before you jump in there. Uh, there are a couple yeah. things I wanted to point out. So one is, you know, you, you brought up this really great point is that, you know, the the buyers have all this more information, all this information, you know, ahead of time before they even speak to you. And and that for me, that's that's a little bit of a perpetuated myth, thanks to HubSpot, because they focus on inbound. That's true for an inbound lead, number one. However, outbound, that's not always the case. Uh, and secondly, and more importantly, is people say that as if it's, it's, it's a bad thing, that, oh, my God, the buyer has so much more information. And it's kind of like, well, hold on a second. You know, here's a coin. That may be heads, but on tails, the other side is that so does the seller. We have as much, if not more, information about them than they do about us. They only have the information they can find about us, right? There's so much more about those people. So I, I, I love when people bring that up because it's, it's one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, and as far as the disruption in the car industry, absolutely. I don't even think it's it's Tesla that's disrupting it. It's Lyft and Uber. You know, my kids are nine yeah. and seven. You know, I don't know how old your kids are, Adam, but there's a good chance that my kids aren't going to have a car because they're just going to have an on-demand car service because I don't want to pay $300 a month for a teenager to drive a car. It's just an insurance. I mean, like, why would I want to pay that? So um, it's going to be a very, very disruptive world. And, and even if you saw today with, with what's happened with J.P. Morgan and Amazon and Berkshire Hathaway, they're going to create their own healthcare system, right? That's not focused on profits. I mean, the disruptive world is coming. I mean, it, it's not even coming. It's here. We just need to yep. start paying attention. So anyway, I, I got a little bit on my soapbox. I apologize. Go, go ahead. Yeah. You, you take that whenever you'd like. I, I'm totally in agreement. Um, and, and I do find that there is a lot of resistance to leveraging these technologies. We're definitely going to be talking about that. But like you said, uh, we have a lot of opportunity. Um, whenever there's change, that means there's always going to be opportunity. And, and we're there to be able to take advantage of it. And that's really what we want to talk about and the guts of what we're going to talk about today um, is where do we see this technology becoming pervasive quickest? Where do we find that that people are already making investments and where people think about making investments today. So jumping right in here, um, uh, everyone can read, but for those of you listening alone, along here, uh, what technologies that have not been embraced in sales right now do you expect to become more widely adopted in 2018? So what are, what, are the, uh, what are the next best things out here? And so what we see, uh, uh, by the way, we have pulled over 100 people um, and those people are primarily in the sales leadership or sales operations role. Um, and uh, we've done this very, very recently. So these polls went out over the last month and a half, and um, we have been capturing those up until uh, actually about last week. So these are kind of up-to-date stats that we've seen, and it's a good number of, of folks around the uh, country, primarily U.S.-based here, um, where we get this. And we see that uh, communication enhancements are number one on the list, so 46% of the folks we surveyed here think that more enhancements in the communication um, going back and forth are going to be the first one. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, prospecting automation, how do we help? Again, we were talking about early, early top of the funnel type of, of situations. How do we learn more? Um, big data, so just capturing more data and leveraging it, followed by machine learning and AI, which uh, I'm sure we can get into a hot debate on. But, um, but number one is, is communication enhancements. So communication enhancements um, uh, for us uh, is really falls into the category of things like uh, what we use internally, Slack, or communication externally as well with uh, chat messaging on a website. So um, big things here, we can see a lot of information uh, coming to us uh, in, in using that communication. Um, one of the things that I found, uh, and we're employing a lot of this in our own company today and the way we're changing things up, um, is how people, um, again, kind of are used to now having multiple modes of communication. It used to be I pick up the phone and I call someone and that's it. Um, and that is by and far my still favorite way to get a hold of someone because I still, I think that uh, people are losing sight of that, but, um, but for, for other folks, you know, there's email, obviously, and that's kind of been around for, for a while now. We're starting to see that chat and communication, which is much more on demand, is a lot bigger, uh, becoming a lot bigger space for people. And I think there's a lot of people that want to get into this. That's what we're seeing here in this, uh, in this survey result as well. So in this survey results, were, did it, as you're describing it, it sounds almost like communication enhancements internally within the organization as it relates to the sales team, meaning how do I share knowledge with my sales team better? Is that a little bit 
I don't know if I'm going off on a tangent or is that really kind of what you guys were able to decipher from the from the yes. data? We, lo we lump this together in a little bit different way. So when we think about communication, we think about it both uh, internally as well as externally. So uh, internally, you know, I'm going to speak to what I know best, which is my own company. Um, so here at Octave, we have uh, in the last year, in 2017, we standardized. Um, one of the things we noticed uh, for our internal communication is that uh, we were kind of across the board. We have our, our G Suite or Google Suite, um, and I know a lot of smaller businesses and even larger businesses now are starting to adopt G Suite. Um, and so we, we kind of initially started using the Google chat there. However, we had other people using email as their primary way to, to communicate across teams. Um, and then um, on top of that, you have text messages, you have phone calls, and then there was basically we didn't have any control over other means of communication. So engineers and product teams were using um, their own tools, and they actually were the first ones to utilize Slack. Um, so we made a cognitive decision because we were using, I think it was seven different communication channels within our small organization um, that we could have been a lot more efficient if we standardized down to one. So we made a concerted effort to standardize on Slack. And for us internally, it has been a night and day difference just for that one, um, that one uh, uh, channel, essentially, that for internal communication. Now everyone um, at inside of Octave has a Slack channel. We have all of our different groups that we can communicate with, and that is the, the primary way that we communicate within our office. We've seen productivity go up. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I don't want to turn, this is not a, a let's, let's promote Slack kind of thing, but you said you went from seven to one. So does yes. that mean the company as a whole has said, look, anything you want to do has got to be communicated via Slack, not email? Like, is that, is, is that part of a mantra? It, it is the best attempt that we can, is that you try to use Slack first. If you're looking for immediate answers from one or more people, you, you are utilizing Slack. Um, again, yeah, not trying to promote that, but hey, it works really, really well for us. Um, and, and just consolidating, quite honestly, I think it probably could have been any mode of communication we cared about. Um, but the speed of business again and the speed of, of which uh, we need answers, um, Slack and the, the chat messaging for us internally uh, really forces uh, uh, someone to make sure that they are addressing it. Um, maybe it's not immediate, but it, it is at least there at all times versus email, which tends to get buried. So for us, chat, just, say, just out of curiosity, Adam, since you since you guys implemented that, how much is your inbound email from internally, not externally, but how much inbound email have you reduced? Twenty percent, thirty percent. Quite a bit. I don't know that I have the exact percentage, but I know on a regular basis I get between 80 and 100 emails a day, um, and I have been really good about dialing those back, and I will bet you I am down at least 30 or 40 percent on top of that. All right, that's huge. That's the piece people should take away is that, look, you know, there's, granted you have another channel to monitor, which is Slack versus email, but there is something to be said about this immediacy of Slack, and my guess is you probably don't pay attention too much to punctuation and and uh, proper yeah. grammar in Slack as much as you do in email. So that saves a ton of time. So yeah, let, let's go forward because I, I don't want to dig in, but that, that's interesting insights. Yeah, absolutely. So um, again, kind of communication enhancements. We're going to dig into more of this uh, again a little bit later here, but we're going to we're going to keep moving forward for, for time's sake. Um, so uh, this next question, in the next year, what sales technology investment do you expect to make for your team? So this is, again, kind of narrowing in on specifically sales. And you can see here, um, pipeline management is uh, coming out to be number one, followed by predictive analysis. And then contract management, electronic signature, learning software, and then making no additional uh, investments, and then followed by email tools and document management. So, um, pipeline management. To me, this is uh, uh, this one is is uh, should be always at the top of the list here. Um, as sales cycles are changing, what we're finding is that uh, even though buyers are coming into the process later, uh, in other words, they are becoming more educated prior to engaging in, with a salesperson, prior to becoming essentially inside that pipeline. We still find that sales cycles uh, across the industry, across uh, all of our research, are growing ever so slightly, and that's largely due because the buying process itself is starting to become more complex. Um, what we find in our own sales, as well as uh, from the research we've done, uh, is that there are more buyers, essentially more stakeholders, they're becoming involved. CEB this last year had a stat um, that in, in general, 
Um, it went from 4.8 buyers or, or uh, influencers within a deal up to 5.3. Um, so on average, there's more people involved, which is prolonging those sales cycles and becoming it a little bit more hard to um, really forecast. Um, and so pipeline management is definitely becoming a big deal as people are trying to figure out what are the triggers that are moving one, uh, one pipeline or one deal from one stage to the next. So getting that forecasting. Um, and, and I'm kind of managing both sides of the fence here, so I'm a little bit of new business right now, a little bit of existing business, and what I always tell uh, my, uh, my seniors is that uh, my job is, sure, I need to bring in as much money as I can and retain as much money as I can, but what they expect from me is to be accurate. I need to be able to forecast the best I possibly can, um, so the better I have a handle on my pipeline, the better I can, I can do that. And I think that's always what, what uh, the C-level is generally asking for, just to be accurate. Adam, and I've got a question, and again, I don't know if we're going to drop product names. This is never a product show, but can you explain a little bit of the difference between pipeline management and predictive analysis, right? Like, they feel like separate silos, but I also feel like there could be some overlap there. So, again, you know, I don't know if you're willing or can share how you guys are seeing that, but just to give people an understanding of what that means. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I do see these things as, as uh, uh, pretty separate. I'm sure that we can uh, talk about some overlap, but for me, predictive analysis, I apply that, that theory into uh, more about what, um, what our customers, and I'm going to think about existing business re really quick, but what are our customers, um, how, how do they expect to change their business in the next year um, how do they expect to be able to um, uh, uh, maybe utilize our products in the next year? Those types of things. Um, so capturing a lot more data about folks and how they are, are um, interacting with our business, to me, informs predictive analysis. The more that we can understand things to the effect of, um, let's say that uh, deals over $100,000, for example, um, tend to uh, take, you know, let's say, you know, 85% longer than deals that are under $10,000. If I have enough data to be able to prove that, and if I can even start getting more granular about things like uh, industry, for example, a lot of people use industry or markets to be able to define their, their, um, their deal sets. And so if I can start understanding and grouping these people together and start learning more about the characteristics of each one of those segments, that allows me to predict maybe what the next new business deal comes in is going to look like. Um, what we do internally at Octave, uh, I should, probably should, should give a quick plug, but basically uh, what Octave does is we help manage uh, uh, contracts and proposals, specifically from the document creation perspective all the way through the contract management, signing, e-signature, and storing. We're capturing a lot of data around these documents. What we're doing is we're doing this predictive analytics perspective to be able to start making um, suggestions to our customers to say, hey, um, based upon your data, um, you should expect to see this deal, uh, this contract get looked at by four and a half people before it goes close one. That's a predictive analytic that we can apply to business to, so we can anticipate um, what good is, what characteristics good are, and how do we compare everything to that good scenario. That, versus pipeline management. Pipeline management to me is a lot more around human management, right? So every rep has their own pipeline. I need to be able to understand the accuracy of each one of those individuals and then how all those individuals make up the total company number. And I need to understand all of the small little pieces inside that, uh, 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 inside that pipeline so I can do my analysis of where we're gonna land at the end of the year. Um, so again, uh, taking a look at the deals in there and, the, and I would say the uh, exterior pieces of data, like what stage they're in, um, how many touch points have we had with that uh, uh, opportunity, and um, essentially what stages or what steps are left in that decision-making process and form that pipeline management. And, that, and that's to me is where I see that crossover, right? Like that yeah. pipe, right? Once you have that data from the pipeline management, you could then, in theory, start to apply some predictive analytics to it, which I which I love. So, um, thank you for clarifying that because I, I think that's always that's a gray area I'm seeing a lot these days. Yeah, and, and to be honest, and then I love your perspective on this as well. There's a lot of gray areas in in this realm. It seems like there's a lot of overlap, and we're gonna we're actually gonna show that here in a second around. Even technologies where one technology can be applied to many different 
areas within a business to be able to get growth. And I think that's one, one thing we're going to touch on a little bit later as far as best practices. Okay. But let's keep moving on here. Just a couple more questions. Um, so which middle of the funnel metrics do you expect will provide the most insight for, for improving your sales process? Um, and so uh, what this one is, is um, uh, top, of the, top of the list here is engagement metrics. So engagement metrics are the uh, metrics that are, uh, are captured based upon how your customers, how your prospects are engaging with your, essentially your content, engaging with your sales process. Are they engaging with it? Are they being passive around it? Um, so that is uh, what engagement metrics mean. I can give more specific examples if you'd like. Uh, followed by content usage metrics. So the way that we define this one is um, what content is being used by a salesperson internally in order to move deals from one step to the next. Um, uh, followed by value metrics. So oftentimes we hear, um, and especially in the B2B sales world, ROI. What is my ROI? So what are the value metrics we can apply to um, some of the deals? Efficiency metrics. Um, so efficiency. Uh, can also be a kludgy term, but efficiency is essentially how quickly, uh, how much time, typically efficiency or efficient um, processes are measured in time, uh, followed lastly by activity metrics, which I honestly was kind of surprised about because activity generally floats to the top of most people's scales when we talk about uh, metrics uh, for uh, managing a funnel. Um, but yeah, I'd like to have your take on this one as well. Again, I thought... Let me, yeah, let me, let me ask you, what... Can you give some more examples on engagement metrics? You, know, you, you sort of said you, know, you could, you know, tell me sure. more about that. Sure, yeah. So I'm going to pull back on the marketer here of me. Um, so this engagement metrics and behavioral uh, uh, measuring is really the core of digital marketing and what we see sales folks and sales technology is really starting to pick up on. And this, this is where I actually will differentiate I have a, an actual opinion here on the content versus the engagement metrics. So if I'm, if let's say I'm a, I'm a um, sales ops person and my job is to equip my sales team um, with all of the tools they need in order to go, go and sell. Um, when we do that, we typically are deploying all of the same types of tools that most companies are today. I have white papers, I have case studies, I have um, conversation starters around our product lines, I have descriptors, all those types of things. And I'm equipping my sales team to be able to pick and choose which, which one of those pieces of content um, or which one of those tools they're going to employ given the whatever the, the characteristics of the deal they have at the time. And so one of the content usage metrics is all about what are my sales reps picking. And we hear this fairly often in our business of, um, of customers wanting to know, hey, what are my sales reps using most? That must mean right. that is what's working the most. And I, and I would actually uh, defend that that's not necessarily what's working the best. It just happens to be what's being used the most. What we want to understand is what's actually helping deals move through that funnel based upon the engagement, based upon the recipients of those pieces of content or the recipients of those tools. And so that's the engagement metrics. That's why I, I do believe that we see this um, boiling the top because this is the stuff that I believe we're missing the most of. Yeah. So let me let me ask you this because I, I so I and I, you know I apologize I won't mention the name but you know I don't use um, you know I use I did I use a different tool anytime someone asks me for sales training I'm like sure I can do sales training and you know it means a lot of things to a lot of people so I actually send my deck out ahead of time right um, because I don't need to walk anybody through a deck like they can read that in three minutes versus my thirty minutes of wasting their time. Yep. But I do go back and see which pages of the deck they're actually looking at the most, right? Yep. And it could be the logo salad. It could be here's the what I do with SDR teams or here's what I do with AE teams. So I'm trying to get a sense of how much they're engaging with that piece of information. Is that what you're talking about versus the content is, one, is the same thing all the time. It's then within the content, the pieces that appear to matter the most or least, correct? That's exactly right, uh, and, and, and I'll pull on that thread and on that story because, because you know where they're spending their time, because you knew they even took the time to open it in the first place, place now all of a sudden the next conversation you have with those folks are going to be far more relevant to them, and you can even, and this is what we do because obviously we, we employ some of the same tactics, we'll pick up the phone and say, hey, I see you're looking at that right now. Yes. You know, it, why are you looking at that? And, and right. it, it's a conversation starter, and as a salesperson, 
Um, and, and again, we are in a unique place because we are selling a sales tool to salespeople. I find that salespeople, by and large, um, appreciate that. They appreciate the fact that, hey, it's top of mind right now. I'm thinking about it. So yeah, let's have a conversation. Um, don't, I, uh, don't always have to use that tactic, but um, by and large, being, being able to speak highly relevantly at the time that they're thinking about it with the content they're thinking about it, I mean, that's, that's a really nice way to show that you're thinking about them, you're taking care of, of the prospect, and it's the, it's, at the end of the day, that's what we all know, right, is, is technology is only there as a crutch, it's only there to support so that you as a salesperson in the B2B sales process can shine. That's what it's all about. By the way, I would, I would encourage people not to ask why are you looking at that page because why can put people on the defensive like why does Richard have a white background when he's wearing an almost white shirt right, with a white face. Um, that can make me feel very self-conscious, which is what why does. I would encourage people to say, hey, what did you find fascinating? What did you find the most interesting? Because that actually removes any emotional commitment from either party and it doesn't put someone on the defensive, right? Hey, I saw you look at this just out of curiosity what did you find the most interesting? Not, you know, not why did you look at it, but what did you find the most interesting? It's just a, it's a slightly more effective way to ask the same question without, A, making the rep feel like they're, they're you know, crowding and closing in on them um, versus, um, you know, just sort of trying to understand the concept behind it. So that's great. Thank you for explaining that because I, I think that was a, that's a tough one for people to understand. Um, yeah, I do love the fact that this whole activity metric thing, I think that the, the activity metrics are becoming less likely because they're kind of like table stakes, That's right? Exactly. With, with, with the advent of, you know, the connect and sales and, and um, connect leader and, and sales loft and um, outreach and just all these amazing tools, if you're having to manage activity, you're, you got a bigger problem, I think. Now, I think you have to collect the data around activity well. Because if at some point, as you're doing your coaching and your one-on-ones, you need to figure out what's happening, what may be working, what may not be working. And you may have to turn around and go, look, you've only made 10 dials a day. Like, you may need to coach to that. But it's for me, it's no longer the, hey, beatings will continue until morale improves, until you hit 50 dials a day and 30 emails a day, right? Like, that that's so 1999 when I was a sales rep kind of stuff that – We've gotten smarter, right? We've gotten better, and we should be better at that kind of stuff. We should still collect the metrics, but I don't know that you need to manage to them quite so much. I think you know, we have to start treating people like adults, and I think that's the, the beautiful thing about inside sales is as it's matured is that, is that we have to start treating these, everyone a little bit more, a little, with a lot more respect um, as it comes to day-to-day -day without micromanaging. So, Yeah, I'm, yeah. It's all I'm about trying to see it, although I'm – very happy to see it. I'm happy to see that that's not the most important thing anymore. Right? Yeah. That we're getting better at, you know, dialing, dialing, dialing. Right. Um, the one place I would, the the one place I would I would be cautious where that might not matter is if you're calling into the local space. Right. If you're working for a Yelp, if you're working for Groupon, where you have to have a lot of conversations, that might be the one place where activity metrics actually are super important where yeah. you really do have to have 50 calls a day to generate the conversations, et cetera. So, um, so anyway, so let's, um, let's, let's go ahead and move forward. Yeah, absolutely. And just to just kind of sum all that up, I, I really think that if people are starting to think more about quality versus quantity, where it used to just be purely a quantity play. So, um, so great to see that, that people are starting to think about how to evolve that, that conversation a little bit. <clears throat> all right. So let's move on. And, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, sales technology is a somewhat messy space, a little bit. Um, this is one uh, quick snapshot of this, uh, of this space, of how we can break it down. And I, I'm sure you are probably like me, and you've seen probably three or four different cuts of the different space. Um, but all these little icons are different, uh, different uh, providers, different vendors out there, depending upon what you're looking to um, to achieve. So there's a lot out there for people to pick and choose from, um, and there's definitely going to be some overlap in these in these spaces as well. And so being able to be informed as you're going into um, maybe a vendor selection really needs to be, in my opinion, um, needs to be very laser focused on what you're looking to get out of the tool, not necessarily. Um, trying to go find a tool, then find the problem to solve it, obviously. What we need to do is really start 
cutting this through. And I, and I expect that this space is probably going to see some consolidation if we compare this to uh, the marketing space. Uh, marketing is a lot cleaner. It's been obviously around for about 10 there, about five, six years, um, at the very least, uh, a little bit more mature than the, than the sales technology, the sales tech space. Um, so I suspect that we'll probably see a little bit more rigidity coming to this um, as the year goes on. Yep. So this is the, by the way, go, if you go back to that for a second, yep. so this is what I tell people, because they always ask me, and I'm sure someone's going to ask, you know, well, which of these tools do you like, which I actually know is the next slide, but before you buy a tool, right, this is what everybody needs to answer. You need to fill in the blanks on those questions. Before we implement blank, or I'm sorry, after we implement blank, we expect the reps to be better at blank, blank, and blank. After we implement Octave, we expect the reps to do, be better at blank, blank, and blank. What should they be better at? If your answer is closing deals, then you're not answering the question richly enough. That's not a good enough answer, right? You need to go deeper behind, well, what does closing deals even mean at company A versus company B as it looks at something like Octave, right? That is the piece. The other part of the question that you have to do is, hey, after we implement this tool, we're going to define success by an increase in blank, blank, and blank, meaning we're going to implement Octave. We're going to expect the team to do better than at, at these things. And here's how the measurements we are against are going to be against it. And then the final piece of that is, yes or no, we have a baseline from which to grow upon to establish those metrics. Those are the three things you've got to do before you choose any of these tools, whether it's sales, marketing, engineering. I don't care what it is. You better know what you're trying to get out of it and how you're going to improve it and how you're going to measure that improvement to determine whether or not you're going to do it. Now, in many cases, some companies come in and they'll use something like Octave, and, and I think that they're very wide-eyed and they're open. They're like, you know what, Adam? We know we're going to get better at this and this. We're hoping you and your customer success team can help us. By the way, we got no baseline. Our baseline is that, hey, we're still using a fax machine, or hey, we're sending this over just basically with, with you know, DocuSign, which is different than a complete document management platform like Octave, right? Uh, because you guys also do stuff with, with, you know, if you have a marketing document that needs to get approved before, you know, before it's sent out to sales. So you've got all this other stuff. So that is the piece I, I just, I really passionately don't just buy these tools because you have to, which you do. These tools are now actually table stakes, right? As much as the phone and a telephone buck was in 1997 when I first started, I called out of the yellow pages, old school, right? Home painters, yep, I dialed them all right down the list, okay? That was table stakes. Now this is the new set of table stakes. This is your new yellow pages. Just know how you're going to use it effectively, please. So I'll yeah. Get, I'll, get off my, I'll get off my soapbox again. Sorry. Like, preach. No, keep going. Love it. So... So uh, these are the 10, we have the 10 must-have sales technologies. Uh, these are the ones we actually have been employing at Octave here for a bit of time um, and that I have some personal uh, uh, stake in as well as far as using these and my, my own self. So <clears throat> uh, take these for what they're worth. Uh, again, we um, just picked these because uh, we're, we're very familiar with them and we know that they have made an impact in our own business. So I'd love to get your take on these as well. Um, just from a prospecting uh, this is where we put a lot of focus. It kind of when I went out there and started evaluating where are we going to make spend in the sales process. Um, first and foremost, we uh, when we're selling our own uh, 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 our own product into the space, we have a very broad market. And so the way that we came to the conclusion of where to start investing is we're trying to sell to the ocean, and we need to start narrowing in that focus. How can we get better and better? about really targeting our ideal customer, our ideal prospect. And so we invested first and foremost into a lot of these earlier stage prospecting tools to inform, get the right types of companies, get the right type of, uh, of prospects for us. Zen Prospect has been great for our ABM strategy as we're starting to employ like a lot of companies are, more account-based marketing type of uh, of situation. So Zen Prospecting is, is one we use that we employed very recently. Intercom is the ability for us to actually um, do chat um, directly uh, right there on the website. And then obviously LinkedIn. I think everyone uses LinkedIn. That is probably personally my go-to one tool I use every single day would probably be uh, LinkedIn uh, as I do love networking and I love uh, finding new people out there. So on the prospecting side, that, that's what I, I tend to know. Um, I'm trying to think. 
I use uh, Cirrus Insights. I use Zoom. I use, um, and I, you know, apologies, I use Docsend for some things. I, um, uh, for the e-signature platform, I, I won't mention just because it would be inappropriate since you're the host. Um, I don't know Intercom, so I'm interested about that. What is Intercom? Like, I mean, look, I'm sure people are just curious as I am. So what is Intercom? Yeah, Intercom is, is a chat messaging uh, uh, platform that allows us to uh, communicate people. Again, kind of the, we saw this on the results um, of communication. So this is the external communication platform that allows us um, to engage people right on, on the website. Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So when they're on the, when they're on the homepage kind of stuff, got it. Okay. Got it. Um, excellent. So what, and where do you guys look for your best quality data, right? Um, is that a combination of, of Zen Prospect and LinkedIn? Like, you know, data is the key, right? I got to have good people with decent email addresses and phone numbers. You know, again, yep. you know, this is probably one of the more pluggy type situations, but I feel like it's appropriate because we're talking about the stack. Yeah, so, we have to kind of, there's no, yeah, no avoidance. Right? Right. We, <clears throat> so, we look like idiots if we didn't, so. Yeah, my theory, and I, and I believe this theory, and everyone should adopt this, that uh, uh, I was taught at the early stage of my career, um, we use Salesforce, obviously, as, as a lot of people do, but whatever CRM that you use out there, that is still kind of the de facto, must be the one place that everything exists is in one centralized repository of data. So we do use... Where do you get your data? Where do you get the email addresses and phone numbers and stuff? All, all of that. So wherever we get it, it's going to live, it's going to end up in there. Zen Prospect is who we use for um, our ABM outside of our network. And then LinkedIn is who we use for inside of our network. So when we think about how to prioritize, we always go in network first. So if someone knows somebody, that is almost always going to be a better shot at getting engaged with that customer than a blind or a, 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 a just a cold uh, Zen Prospect is we're going to capture information based upon ABM characteristics. So um, we think about it as, as in network or out of network Great. For, for our outbound. By the way, and I'll give this piece of advice to people, as you're looking at where do I buy quality data, right, because that's always the big thing, whatever it is that you think it is going to be expensive for quality data, multiply that times 10 because you're going to have three reps trying to find the same kind of information and wasting a ton of time. So please, whether it's Zen Prospect or any of the other great tools out there that have quality data in them, please, by all means, understand what you're getting and the opportunity cost of not having it because if you're paying people to research for data that's a tremendous tremendous waste of money and resources there's yeah. an immediate opportunity cost associated with that so um so please do that all right let's go forward with with, with sort of the next set of things sure yeah absolutely and, and then again presentation for us things that we found really uh, help prioritize time um calendly helps uh, and i've seen this pop up more and more being able to uh, 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 have people schedule time on your calendar. So if you have a BDR team or a appointment setting team, um, we utilize Calendly to help that pass, uh, that, that lead pass from the BDR team onto the sales reps team. Um, and then quickly, because we're starting to run out of time here, um, just a couple other of these. Uh, obviously, we, we eat our own dog food or drink our own champagne. So contract and e-signature. So this is around document management, obviously, what, what uh, um, Octave does is core. And then um, e-signature has become a very much need to have in the business as, as um, trust and being able to get uh, documents signed quickly um, and effectively. And then we do then, we put everything around uh, pipeline management activity tracking all the way into Salesforce. So everything is hooked into the hub. Great. Thank you. So just a couple quick practices or best practices here. <clears throat> um, Again, I, this is where I really love to, to pick your brain, um, and, and as you've kind of touched on a lot of these best practices, you already mentioned, make sure you're going in. You're, if you're going to buy technology, fantastic. You're going to have to evolve your business, but make sure you're doing it with the right purpose. Um, and make sure you're thinking about it as a competitive advantage. So my first bullet point is this is, this is the way I think about what are we going to do in 2018. Um, you may identify areas that you just are lacking inherently within your um, um, let's say you, you need to generate more pipeline, you need to have um, more time for your sales reps to, to get face-to-face -face with your customers, whether those may be. Um, but always think about how, what are you going to do in order to take an advantage. Make sure you're, you're always thinking about your competitive advantage. How do we get one step in front of our competition? Because I guarantee they're, doing, they're thinking the same thing about you. Um, so I always like to think about how do we actually get a selling advantage and then measure that. Uh, can we win more business based upon 
um, this technology. Um, investing in technology obviously aligns to your core selling activities. Um, we've seen this a lot of times. Um, if I'm selling a product uh, into uh, whether it was you know exact target in my last position or here at Octave, um, you do have those people um, that come in or like, hey, I, I don't know if I need you, but I think it looks cool. Let's try this. Um, make sure that, that you have that purpose that you are um, that you are buying this for, not to change anything dramatically within your sales organization. You should really be improving on something you already have a strategy around uh, versus trying something completely brand new. Um, so make sure that, that uh, what you're buying really aligns with who you are as an organization, how you're selling, um, and don't try to, to really go outside that, those realms too quickly. Otherwise, it's going to be hard to, to tell if you're making an impact or not. Yeah, I think the, the thing, uh, the thing yeah. I say to people all the time is that, you know, people are going to buy from you for two reasons. One, because of what you do or what your organization does. The other reason is going to be because of how you do business, right? And so if these tools can positively affect the way you do business and how you do business, that's the differentiator. Just because you can do it faster doesn't make you a differentiator. You got to do it better. And sometimes better doesn't mean faster. Better actually means slower in the beginning, faster later, so that the whole sales cycle is different. But make sure you understand the difference between better and faster. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> Third bullet point here is customer experience. So customer experience uh, is, is near and dear to my heart. Um, we are coming into a place where um, you, know, you, you are going to be having more competition and how you interact with your customers is going to be a big, big differentiator. Marketers are, setting, are starting to set a table that um, has a certain level of expectation. Again, they're becoming more uh, efficient. At, uh, buyers are becoming more efficient at understanding what customer or what uh, vendors can do, um, and they expect that experience uh, all the way through. So, it's way too often do I see uh, marketing really doing a great job of making sure the brand is is being elevated, that uh, value props are being talked to, and uh, that gets leads all the way up until the point their opportunity, and then all of a sudden. I'm in this black and white slide um, slideshow, and I'm kind of talking about the messaging that was two iterations ago, and there's a disconnect between what maybe even the website says and what I'm saying as a sales rep. That to me is a big miss. We need to make sure that we are being more and more aligned as, again, that chasm hopefully becomes closer and closer together as marketing and sales get more aligned, that that expectation and experience that we're providing for our customers and for our prospects is uh, maintained and really put uh, uh, so, so given some hard thought all the way from lead status all the way throughout that customer status and beyond. We try to make sure that we're keeping cognitive of what is it, what is it that they feel, how are they interacting, every touch point. Let's make sure that we understand that what the message needs to be on point on every one of those uh, 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 stages within that sales and prospect journey. So yep. customer experience. Is going to be a huge differentiator. Again, how can you get a competitive advantage? Think about that customer experience. Um, this one I always like, like throwing in here. Uh, a lot of people believe that, hey, that what we're doing is we're trying to eliminate a whole bunch of salespeople's jobs, um, and that's not the case. Uh, it, it, for me, again, technology is only a crutch. It's only a way so that we can provide either more time back in the days of our salespeople or to make sure that they look and are equipped to do a better job themselves. In a B2B world, it is the human, it is the, it is the people, it is the relationship. At the end of the day, people always buy from people, and I am always going to stay firm on that. But we can always improve. Um, and uh, one good example of how someone employed Octave, one of our top customers came to us with a very specific ask. He said, I want to save my salespeople, literally, they had uh, recorded and they had this benchmark down on their proposals, um, and it took them 108 minutes to create a single proposal, and they wanted to save 40 minutes per proposal. Pretty straightforward, very accurate kind of benchmarking, but the reasoning behind why is because they wanted to provide their salespeople back two hours a week so they could use those two hours and go out and sell more and basically get in front of their customers more. I thought it was a perfect way to articulate it. It gives us as a vendor very clear objectives and it gives the outcome before anything ever started. So what they're doing is trying to highlight their salespeople even more by removing some of the redundant processes where we 
uh, we as a as a company come into play, and a lot of these uh, uh, a lot of these vendors, a lot of technology out there is there to save people time, it's so that they can have that art process of the selling side. Cool, awesome. And, yeah, and the last thing, and and uh, as a technology uh, uh, vendor as well as a consumer. Um, I think everyone has probably uh, uh, felt a little bit this about this, but change is not easy. Um, whenever you are changing technologies, whether it's something simple or it's something um, very complex, uh, you know, salespeople tend to tend to like to things that they know very well, and so getting them to change their behavior is not always easy. Make sure you think about that. Make sure you have a good plan before you employ any technologies. Think through how you're going to deploy that. Think think through how you're going to get buy-in from all the salespeople as well as sales management. So um, can't can't go and emphasize that enough. Yeah, I would say that people, I, you know, one of the people, people always ask me what are my favorite books to read, and, and I haven't found one yet in this subject matter, but I think it's really critical. If someone has one, I'd love to take the advice and read it, which is that sales management is actually all about change management. And I know there's a ton of books out there about change management and understanding how to do that and how to implement it in a great way. Um, so if anybody ever has a great recommendation, I've read a couple and they're kind of dry, so I don't want to recommend them. I got through them. Um, but <laughs> if anybody's got a good recommendation on a change management book as it relates to business, um, I think that would be a, that, that's a big piece of all this kind of stuff. So We could always co-author one. Yes, we could. Actually, all right. So... <laughs> um, we got a we got a question coming in from the audience from Kenneth. Um, you know, the question is how AI comes to name and, and have you used any AI tools, right? I, I've got a good theory about AI, um, but it's it's still very early stage in that space. You guys looking at any AI? Are you guys trying anything in AI? Kenneth, thank you for the question too. Yeah, and I, I definitely have a lot of opinions on AI. Um, the uh, the the concept of of AI actually helped teach a, a college class, and one of the questions from the from the students was if, if we believe that like the movies are going to come true and AI is going to end up being a Terminator type of scenario. Um, so there's two versions of AI. The AI where there's actually self-thinking machines. I don't think that that's anything even remotely close where we're at. But when we think about artificial intelligence as in can we have a computer do run all the data, make suggestions for us, um, I still think in our industry, um, we are a few years away from true AI. I think we have a lot more data that we need to capture. And that's at the end of the day, uh, my opinion on the matter is we still are learning a lot. We're still employing a lot of these technologies and a lot of these technologies are producing just a ton of data. We don't have enough of that consistency of data across enough industries and across enough people to be able to start making um, uh, uh, AI a true um, I would say a true, uh, uh, even uh, nice to have here yet today. I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done um, in the sales space uh, to make sure that computers are there making our decisions for us. We need yeah. to make sure that they have enough data. But I'd, I'd be curious of your thoughts as well. Yeah, I think I think we're getting closer, and, and I agree. We're in the data collection stage. We're trying to figure out what the baselines are, and we now have the ability to capture that data and start to make some interpretations. And again, my space is limited, so you know I am not the guru of AI by any stretch of the means. I think the two that I, the, the ones that I see the most often in a sales-related role are um, Chorus, Gong, and Exec Vision. You know, sort of these these uh, recording platforms that allow you to see what words are being used and not being used, etc. But I, I think we're still in the data collection phase. I think I do think in the next six to twelve months in that specific space. We'll see more of it come out where you'll actually see live coaching in the moment. That's where I think AI is going to be super helpful. Um, but again, it's almost like a, a data in, analyze the data, and then based on statistics, here's the data out from the AI tool that says, well, here's what we think you should say, because 75% of the time it tells you that the deal is going to move forward. To me, that's still, you're just getting faster and better at data analytics as much as it is... Um, actual quote-unquote AI in the Hollywood conceptual way that we think of these things. But again, I, I'm still so new to the AI space um, that I, I'm happy to be re-educated on that if I have it completely wrong. Um, but but I, I think we're getting there. But I don't, you know, I think what AI is going to do is, for lack of a better definition, and I think John Barrow said it best, it's going to get rid of the average salesperson. If you can't take the information that's getting, coming back to you as a sales rep and make adjustments on the fly, live and in the moment, you're going to have a harder time being successful in sales. 
That's the piece that I think where AI is really going to help us. We're going to sort of thin the herd of salespeople. Now, <laughs> the good news, if you're a good salesperson and you like being in sales, technically that should mean more money for you over the, the course of your lifetime, right? Um, and I would say that even adding, look, I've been in sales since 1993 out of college. And even before that, you know, I, I was in sales a little bit, you know, in high school and college. But I'm a better salesperson based on the technology that came along the last 20 years. I can only imagine what it's going to be like to be 23 years old, 25 years old today, coming to work in a place like Octave with the technology exists, and then fast forward in 20 years. I don't know. It's going to be interesting. Yeah, yeah, it will. And I know we're getting close to time here. But, uh, uh, is there any other questions out there? Yeah, that's it. We didn't get a lot of questions from the audience, but that doesn't surprise me because people love to see these surveys and get the results and take it in themselves. Um, so, Adam, if people do want to get a hold of you, do you have a do you have some contact information that they can where they can see you? Um, obviously, by all means, contact Adam. Uh, take a look at Octave if you're looking at some document management things. Um, I'll even throw the free plug in. Adam, I'm willing to bet you guys are always looking for salespeople. If you're looking, if you happen to be a sales rep uh, looking, feel free. I'm sure Adam can point you in the right direction at HR or whatever their process is. So, um, yeah. and believe me, if you come in saying, hey, Adam, I saw your presentation. I'd love to come in and get a job. That's going to put you ahead of the line of other, five other people. I guarantee you, I appreciate good salespeople, and I do my best to, to make sure I respond either positively or negatively, but I will respond, especially if you're relevant. But yeah, absolutely. I have one last question for you, Adam, and I know we're going a little bit over, but I have one last question for you, which is, you know, if you could implement two new technologies tomorrow, snap your fingers, didn't have to worry about budget, didn't have to worry about approval, something that would help your sales team go forward, right, move deals forward. What kinds of technologies, what space, you don't have to mention a name, but what space might they be in? What is Octave looking at? Yeah, I think I think for us this year, uh, it was we are looking at <clears throat> scaling out our sales team. So so your uh, sales uh, person question or, or statement was a good one. So for me, it's, it's going to be a lot around, again, probably pipeline management. Um, as we are looking to scale those out, what I'm looking to do is make sure that we can bring on new sales reps effectively and quickly. So um, think a lot around um, how do we uh, make sure that they have the right talk tracks, all those types of things. And actually, you mentioned Gong and, and a couple of these voice recording. Those, that's the other one that's really top of mind for me right now um, is we are, I would say, still playing catch up in our, in our uh, company of doing the recordings. Um, how do we, and like you said, we're never going to make our best rep better. That's, that's not what our goals are. What we're trying to do is, is identify what good is and bring everyone up to that. So for us, um, again, is a lot about uh, we have very, very good sales reps, so we're going to be onboarding a lot of new ones. I want to make those people come on board faster and uh, get my mediocre reps to be, um, be top reps. So those are the two areas I'm looking at right now is the voice recording. Um, so we have that as a standardized uh, uh, process as well as um, onboarding tools um, for, for bringing on new reps. Great. Thank you, Adam. I appreciate your time today. Thank you to Octave. I know you had some people behind you in marketing who helped put this deck together. So yep. thanks to Octave for, for being a sponsor, and thanks to the marketing team for putting together, um, doing a survey, collecting the data, and sharing it with all of us. We appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thank all you, right, Rick. Thank you. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.